in botany from Kent State University. Her interest in plants and love of botanical gardens have led her to work at such institutions as the Cleveland Botanical Garden, Mount Cuba Center, the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, and her current position as a horticulturist at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. Please welcome Justine today. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us this presentation. All right. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Uh, hopefully you are able to see my presentation now. Uh, so yes, I am a horticulturist at the Kemper Center for Home Gardening at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Normally, I would be at the front desk welcoming you all into the Kemper Center, answering your plant questions in person. Unfortunately, the Kemper Center is closed to the public uh, for now because of the pandemic, but hopefully soon uh, you'll be able to, to come in and, and talk to me in person, hopefully soon. But um, for now, uh, my, the contact info will be at the end for how you can get in touch uh, if you do have any, any plant questions uh, for the garden. That'll all be at the end. So, but let's get started today. We're going to talk about indoor gardening, house plants, but also some things that you might not think about uh, when you think about indoor gardening, uh, and how to get the most out of them. How to really help your house plants to thrive. House plants are really common. Um, they're easy, but uh, with these tips, it'll be even easier. You'll have really good luck with them. Okay, so just a couple basic things about plants before we get started. Uh, hopefully you all can remember back to your high school biology classes when you learned some of this stuff. Uh, but if not, here's a quick refresher. Plants are living organisms just like you and me. And what sets them apart is that they have, of course, leaves, roots. Some of them have flowers like this water lily, beautiful water lily here have flowers. Some of them have cones like this pine tree here has cones. Those are a little different, uh, but no matter what, the things that make a plant a plant is that it has uh, a method of producing food for itself using photosynthesis. So it uses light to create food. So it doesn't need to eat like you and I, it actually makes its own food using light. And it also needs water and air to do this. So uh, here's just a little diagram also of a plant cell. Some things that set uh, plant cells apart from, from the cells that you and I have. They have chloroplasts, that's where the photosynthesis takes place. They have a cell wall that's rigid, it's hard. That's what gives, you know, like crunchy lettuce or crunchy celery, it's crunch, that's actually the cell walls. And they have a vacuole which holds water. So a lot of what makes a plant stand up straight is actually water. So water, light and air, very important uh, for plants. Just a couple basic things about house plants before we move on. Um, so we talked about plants in general, house plants in specific, just a little basics. Um, mostly they are tropical shade loving plants that you'll find growing in the understory of rainforests around the world. Um, so, so things like this, these foliage plants that are really beautiful, uh, but not all house plants are, are like that. Some like cacti love the sun, they love the dry conditions of the desert. And others like this sage plant that you can grow indoors is an herb. They love Mediterranean climates that are dry in the winter and wet and hot in the summer. So it really just depends on, on the plant, what kind of conditions they like, but most house plants are gonna be the tropical shade loving type that grow in the understory of the rainforest. They can tolerate the lower light conditions of most people's houses. Little bit of history about, about houseplants. So evidence of houseplants being grown or, or potted plants being grown date back all the way to the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians. So having potted plants, it meant that you could control the growing conditions of the plant better. And it was useful even as far back as, as ancient times. When glass making technology improved, they were able to have greenhouses. So this is the Linnaean house at the Missouri Botanical Garden. It was originally built by Henry Shaw as an orangery to grow orange trees. Uh, but having, having access to glass 
really up the game for growing plants indoors and creating um, environments that uh, are suitable to them in otherwise cold climates like St. Louis. And then of course in the Victorian era, collecting exotic plants became a huge hobby. Everybody was crazy for orchids, ferns, and other tropical plants. Everybody wanted to get their hands on the latest and greatest. Um, so that really bumped up the popularity of house plants as well and collecting. Okay, so let's get down into the nitty gritty about how to take care of these guys. So, so you have your house plant and remember one of the things that's really important for them is light. So when you're thinking about house plants, here's some of the things that you wanna be thinking about in terms of light. So the direction that your window faces, that the light is coming in and the, that's the light that the plant is getting, the direction that that window faces is actually really important. So we're in the Northern hemisphere. And so most of our light is gonna be coming in through south windows, okay? The sun rises in the east, so east facing windows get morning sun, west facing windows get the setting sun, and north windows get mostly indirect light, okay? The sun isn't necessarily gonna be beating through those north facing windows um, all the time. So it's very important to take into account, but of course, like here in my apartment, I have south facing windows, but I have trees in front of them. So it's not necessarily a, you know, a one and done, oh, I have a south facing window, I can grow cacti here. Uh, you have to take into account other things, uh, such as things outside the window, as well as the size of the window. You know, a really small window is not going to provide as much light, even if it is south facing as a huge north facing window, for example the condition of the glass. Um, you know, if your glass is really dirty, hasn't been cleaned in a long time, uh, it's actually gonna let less light in for the plants. So uh, definitely recommend cleaning those windows if, if you have house plants counting on you uh, too for their light needs. And this is just a question I like to ask anytime I'm, I'm situating a plant in a new place. What is the plant's view of the sky? You know, if you're looking from the plant's perspective, how much of the sky is it really seeing? And if it's really not seeing that much of the sky, then you might want to think about putting it in a place where, where it'll get more light. And here's just some photos. This one is of the Kemper Center. This is the south window in the Kemper Center. And so you can see not only is this a south window, but it actually sticks out from the building and it has these skylights here. So this gets plenty of sun. This is, was in the winter time, you can see the snow. We have amaryllis in the window, just loving it. Um, and paper whites as well. So this is a really great window for growing house plants that like sun because not only is it south facing, but it also has the skylights. That's extra, extra view of the sky for those plants. And then I have this photo here, just as a, an illustration of what can happen if you leave a plant just sitting in a window and don't do anything else with it in terms of, of, of turning it. So it'll start to grow towards the light, okay? So what I recommend is just every time you water your plants, I do this every time I water, just turn the plant so that it's not stretching towards the light and it'll stretch out the other way and it'll be straight up. Um, it just looks a little nicer that way. So, and, and they'll appreciate it as well to have a more even, even exposure to the light. Supplemental lights can be very useful, uh, especially for plants that need a, lot of, need a lot of light and you just aren't able to provide it with your existing windows. It's totally normal. And sometimes you'll have to give them some extra light. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some plants that need extra light a little later, um, but they're great. They can help plants be fuller and bushier. They can give seedlings. If you're starting things from seed, you can give them a head start in the winter time with grow lights and you'll have really strong seedlings for the spring. And of course you can grow plants anywhere. You can grow plants in your basement, uh, have lovely African violets or, or in this case, this photo is of some bean plants uh, in, in, the, in a basement. So you can grow plants anywhere with, with grow lights. And this is a photo of grow lights in the hardy plant nursery at the botanical garden. These are LEDs. So there's different kinds of grow lights. Uh, they all work the same way. They just give extra lights to plants. So LEDs are the most energy efficient, uh, but they are a little expensive. So um, keep that in mind if you're, if you're looking to purchase any. Watering, so again, another important part about owning plants is, is watering them. So there 
are symptoms of overwatering and underwatering that look the same. So like this plant here, this is a yucca plant in a pot. You can see the leaves are flagging, uh, which just means that they're kind of droopy. There are yellowing leaves at the bottom of the plant. There's uh, classic symptoms of some kind of watering problem. But just by looking, it's hard to tell whether this plant is being overwatered or underwatered because actually the symptoms are very similar. So if you think about um, a plant that's underwatered, doesn't have a lot of water, um, water is escaping the plant through, through photosynthesis, through its natural uh, life cycle, and those vacuoles inside the cells, they shrink, and that's what causes the plant to lose turgor and to um, sort of uh, flop like this. And if you overwater a plant, something sort of similar happens. What, what ends up happening is that the roots, so you can see this is the stem of a plant, and it should have lots of healthy roots. You know, that root ball should be almost as big as this pot. But as you can see, this is only as big as the roots are because they all died because they were eaten by bacteria and fungi that were thriving in an overly moist condition. So now this plant didn't have any roots left. And without roots, they can't take water up into their cells. So the cells lose turgor plant becomes wilty and it ends up looking just like this. So uh, something to definitely take into account if you're, if you're wondering whether you're overwatering or underwatering a plant, if it's looking droopy, just feel the soil. If the soil feels moist, then that means you're giving a little too much water. If it feels dry, then it's definitely time to water. Uh, so consistency is definitely important when it comes to uh, house plants except for things like um, cacti or other plants that um, need less water and also in the winter time. So in the winter time here in the Northern hemisphere where we are, there is less sun coming in, less uh, intense sunlight and also the days are shorter. So plants sort of, a lot of tropical plants will enter a, a dormant period and they'll start to, they'll, they'll slow down, they won't grow as much. And because they're not growing as much, they don't need as much water. So consistency is key, but keep in mind that at different times of year, you might have to water at different levels. So important things to keep in mind. And here's a photo of a poor little cacti that got overwatered. Um, I am very guilty of doing this. Cacti are very sensitive to uh, excess moisture. So if you see, uh, if you have ever had a cacti and it started to look like this with the leaves turning mushy and the stem turning mushy, uh, unfortunately that's a sign of, of too much water for the poor little guy. Okay, and not all water is the same. So water that we get out of the tap has chlorine. Now, most plants are not affected by the levels of chlorine that are in municipal water. There's just not enough chlorine to really make a difference. But some plants are really sensitive to chlorine and also mineral salts that could be present in tap water. So examples include carnivorous plants like this Venus flytrap and this uh, Nepenthes pitcher plant. Uh, they really benefit from using rainwater or purified water. So you can buy purified water at the store, uh, but rainwater is actually is actually the best. So uh, collecting rainwater for these kind of plants is good. And also things like uh, spider plants. So you can kind of see on this one, it's not too bad, but spider plants, the tips of the leaves will get sort of brown if they are if there's too much chlorine or too much too many minerals in their water. So I recommend if you're having a lot of issues with that with your spider plants to try switching to purified water or rainwater and see if you if you get any improvement. Now, those brown tips on the spider plants are very common. They can be caused by other things as well, but uh, it's always good to try it out to see to see if that helps. And um, removing, removing chlorine from water is also easy. You just set an open container of water out overnight or for up to 24 hours, and the chlorine will actually dissipate into the air. And it's safe then to use for a plant, um, like a spider plant, to see if maybe that'll help you with the, with the brown tips of the leaves. Soils. So this is how plants get their, most plants get their moisture, they, they get their water through soil. So it's important to pick the right kind. There's so many kinds 
Uh, this photo demonstrates you go to the uh, big box hardware store garden center and there's just so many types of soil. How do you know which one to get? Well, for most situations, just a normal all-purpose potting mix will be good enough for, for, for most plants. Uh, some exceptions include cacti. Um, you can get specifically made cacti soil, but you can also make your own cacti soil by just mixing some sand in with some regular potting mix. Uh, that's basically how they make cacti soil. So no reason why you can't do that at home. So uh, you can also buy the ingredients uh, that, that companies use to make soil. You can buy them in bulk and make your own mixes. You can work with the ratio, see what works. This is a mineral called vermiculite. You might've heard of it. Uh, it is common in potting mix. And this is perlite, another common mineral found in potting mix. And you can buy both of these in bulk and make your own potting mixes or add some to potting mixes that you like, but oh, maybe it needs a little more drainage. You can add some, some perlite. So most houseplants though, they like a well draining soil that um, the water doesn't stay in the potting mix for too long, um, but still it will retain moisture. So trying to find that balance can be a little bit tricky uh, for each individual plant, but um, Luckily with, with, the, with the tropical house plants, they're not super duper picky, but um, you can always mix up your own if you want. Okay, briefly, we'll talk about fertilizer. So uh, fertilizer, it's, uh, sometimes people talk about plant food or feeding plants. It's a little bit of a misnomer because if you remember, we talked about how plants, they make their own food. They don't actually need us to feed them, but uh, it kind of seems like we're feeding them because we're giving them these, these nutrients. Like it's kind of like food, but it's not really food. They make their own sugar. But uh, what fertilizer does give them is elements, three main elements, as well as micronutrients that they need. And this is essential for houseplants. So for plants that you plant outside in the ground, they're able to get nutrients from the soil, breaking down organic matter, mulch, you know, breaking down things like that in the soil. They're able to get nutrients that way. So um, you don't necessarily have to use fertilizers outside, but for houseplants, you definitely do because they exist in a closed environment, right? So all they have is the soil in their pot and that's it. And there might be some breakdown of organic matter happening, but most potting mixes have very little organic matter actually. So giving them nutrients is very important. Um, so this is a granular fertilizer, Osmocote. Uh, this is the kind that we use at the garden. Um, and it has these three main elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, nitrogen helps with the leaf growth. Phosphorus helps with flower development and potassium helps with root development. That's just sort of a basic, uh, it's much more complicated than that, but just in general, that's sort of how it goes. And so Osmocote, uh, here's the numbers. You'll see these three numbers. It's referring to these three main nutrients. So if you're buying plant fertilizer, look for these numbers. And so you'll see that these are ratios and they refer to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And so if you think about for this Osmocote, uh, for every 16 or for every 19, let's say grams of nitrogen in the fertilizer, there will be six grams of phosphorus and 12 grams of potassium. So different plant foods that will have different ratios. Um, miracle Grow makes a pre-made um, houseplant food and it's actually a one, one, one. So it is just a very, you know, but it's, it's already diluted. If you just put it in the soil, you don't have to dilute it with anything. It's really easy, uh, but it has very low ratios of all of these actually, uh, because houseplants, they don't need a lot of fertilizer. Um, you don't have to go, you don't have to go heavy on them, but definitely follow, follow all the instructions on the packaging and, and you'll do just fine. Okay, so, so you have your plant, it's watered, it's healthy, it's doing great, um, but you also have to think about the container that it's in. So I put this in bold because this is definitely a, a you, you should definitely remember this, that any container, any container that a plant is in, it should have at least one drainage hole and a tray to catch excess water. So if you have your plants inside, they should have a drainage hole and a tray to catch water. Now, if you have your plants outside, let's say you have house plants and you put them outside for the summer, they don't need the tray because that will just accumulate water and be a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So forget the tray when they're outside, but when they're inside, 
you need a tray to catch that excess water. And the drainage hole is important. Um, of course, some plants, if you're growing like a bog garden or something like that, where you want the water to stay in the container, then you wouldn't need drainage. But uh, for house plants, it is important that water is able to drain out of the container easily. So just a couple different kinds of containers. These are the most common terracotta. It's inexpensive. They're mostly this sort of rusty orange color, but I have also seen gray terracotta pots that are really cool. Um, so different colors you can also get, and they're porous. So I don't know if you've ever noticed, if you wa have watered a terracotta pot, it starts out one color and then turns a darker color. That's because the water is being absorbed into the pot and air is being exchanged to the roots. So I really like terracotta pots for that reason. It helps, they, they're really good at, at air exchange between the roots and the outside. So you get extra air to the roots. Um, but on really hot days, if, if your plants are outside, um, water will leave through the pot faster than for example, a plastic pot. So keep that in mind. Ceramic, glazed ceramic pots, they can be pretty expensive and heavy, but there's, I mean, oh, just a world of, of styles and colors out there, anything you can imagine. Uh, and if it is glazed, then it will be non-porous. So it'll act sort of like a plastic almost where it'll help keep water in, uh, but also keep air out. So keep that in mind. And then of course, um, plastic and resin pots, they are, Different different prices. I've seen very expensive ones. Uh, the big ones can be expensive, but um, plastic ones can also be pretty cheap. Lots of different colors and styles, of course. Uh, they are also non-porous, so they will not allow much air or water movement uh, through, through uh, the pot, but they're lightweight, they're durable. Um, a lot of like resin pots in particular, they're durable. You can leave them outside. Uh, throughout the winter even, and they won't crack. They might fade in the sun a little bit, but um, they're great for that. So just some, just some examples of containers. And then there's also all, there's, oh, there's a whole world of, of plant containers out there. Uh, some other, some more interesting specialized ones include these wooden orchid baskets. So if you've ever gone to the garden and seen orchids growing in these baskets, it's because it improves airflow to the roots and these are orchids that would normally be growing on tree branches anyway. So it sort of mimics their, their natural environment. They're also easy to hang. Uh, speaking of hanging baskets, um, hanging baskets, houseplants and hanging baskets are really great, especially for vining plants or plants that want to go down. It's perfect for that. And uh, last but not least, kokodama. This is a style of, of keeping houseplants where you wrap the roots in moss and then you wrap that moss with twine. And then these can be hung or set like this one's in a little dish. And you just have to make sure that the moss is moist. Once the moss starts to dry out, then you just soak it in water for a couple minutes and it's good to go again. So that's called kokodama, really interesting method of, of growing plants that doesn't really require a pot. Okay, so let's talk about insect pests and diseases. So these are some houseplant problems that you might encounter. Um, these are the ones we're gonna be talking about. Aphids, mealybugs, scale, spider mites, and soil gnats. We're gonna go into each of these a little in depth in just a second, uh, but where do these pests come from? So you might have your houseplants and everything's fine and then all of a sudden, boom, pest problem. Where, where do they come from? Well, you might have gotten a plant from a friend. You might've gotten a cutting from an exchange group or something like that. Uh, that can be a, a perfect way to get, to get pests is by getting plants from other people and also from nurseries. You just brought your new plant home from Schnooks and all of a sudden you have aphids. Well, they probably came on the plant from Schnooks. Um, of course, no fault to schnooks. It's, it, these, these guys are so wily, uh, we'll get into it. It's, it's, it's easy for them to, to hide in plants, um, but an ounce of, per, of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So quarantining plants, uh, new plants that you're bringing into your house uh, or apartment or where into your space, quarantining for two weeks is recommended. So that will give you a chance to see anything that comes up. Um, but you're keeping that plant away from your other plants before introducing it to the other plants. And that way you can tell whether or not there's any pests or diseases going on. Um, so 
aphids. These little guys are sap sucking insects. Most of the insects that we're going to be talking about are sap sucking. This just means that they have a piercing mouth part that is almost like a straw and they just poke it into the plant and the plant remember is making its own sugars. It's making its own food through photosynthesis but the insects are taking advantage of that and just sucking it up and having it for themselves. And this wouldn't be so much of a problem, they're so small, except when you have a whole bunch. So when you have a whole bunch like this, it can be uh, a real issue. They're slow moving. Sometimes you'll see ones with wings. Uh, sometimes you'll see ones without wings. There's so many different species, all different colors. Uh, these yellow ones are kind of neat looking, um, but they're usually found on the growing tips of the plant. That's where the plant is putting most of its sugar supply, right? So it's growing new growth. That's where the sugars are going to be going. And so that's where the aphids go. How do you know you have aphids? Well, obviously you, you can uh, see them with the naked eye. They are large enough to see with the naked eye, but you might also find sticky honeydew. So that is a residue that they leave behind that is plant sap that's dried on the leaves. And it is a sticky, uh, it's, it's sticky, it's clear, uh, but you can definitely feel it if it's on, if it's on your plants. Uh, you might also feel it on surfaces around your plants. Uh, and what follows the honeydew, that's called honeydew, what follows it is uh, black sooty mold. So mold will start to grow on the sugary sap that's dried on, on the plants. And so if you start to see those things, then you know you have a sap sucker around and, and possibly an aphid. Um, and if there's enough of them at the growing tips, you can, it can lead to deformed leaves and flowers. So definitely something to keep an eye out on. Uh, how to get rid of them, treatments. You can prune off the parts of the plant that are the most infected and then spray the rest of the plant with water. So like a hose spray of water will knock off the rest of the aphids and that can help keep them under control. If that doesn't work, insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils are very effective against these insects. It smothers them, uh, the oils, oils smother them and the soaps break down their bodies. They don't have an exoskeleton, they're a soft bodied insect. So um, the insecticidal soaps work really well for that. Another sap sucking soft bodied insect are mealybugs that you might encounter. Uh, these are pretty common in house plants. They're usually found along the veins on the undersides of the leaves or where uh, the leaves and the stems or the stems join. Um, so you can find them there. They are similar to aphids, they're related to aphids, uh, but they're, they have these sort of white, they have this white powdery appearance. And when they're all in a mass, it can look like cottony you know, kind of like a cottony mass, but because they are sap sucking like aphids, very similar uh, signs and symptoms, the honeydew and the sooty mold. Uh, and I, I have a photo coming up of, of what that sooty mold looks like. It's very distinctive. Once you, once you notice it, you'll even see it outside uh, on, on plants outside as well. Uh, but it can occur on houseplants too. Treatments similar to the aphids, you can prune off the affected parts and spray the rest with, with water. Uh, but uh, at the garden, when we're dealing with mealybugs, we use uh, rubbing alcohol. So a cotton swab dipped in rubbing alcohol, uh, just rub it on there and that will kill them. Insecticidal soaps and oils are also effective. Um, although the larger, the more mature they get, this, like, this, this powdery coating is actually a wax and it will repel uh, the oils and the soaps. So it can be less effective the larger they get. So it's definitely good to, anytime you're dealing with an insect problem, just keep an eye on your plants, monitor them and um, take care of things before they get like this out of hand. Uh, okay, scale. My least favorite um, uh, scale infestations are like a nightmare to me. Um, they are sap sucking insects, very similar to mealybugs and aphids, uh, but they are stationary. Once they're in place, they don't move. They can kind of almost look like a part of the plant, uh, but then they have this hard waxy outer shell that uh, makes them impervious to most of the other methods that we talked about getting rid of insects, um, like spraying with water. It can work, but they're so tightly gripped onto the plant that uh, I've often found that it's just not as effective and the oils and the soaps just runs off of them. Uh, there's lots of different species and they're usually found on the leaf veins. So you'll see like this on the, this is a citrus plant. 
I believe a lemon tree. And you can see the scale are lined up there on the veins. Uh, they, they have their piercing sucking mouth part right on that leaf vein and they're getting that plant juice. And with the honeydew, as you can see here, this is the black sooty mold I was talking about. So it's just like a film of, of mold that grows wherever there is the honeydew residue. So um, that's a telltale sign of, of scale as well as aphids and millibugs. Um, so how do you deal with these guys? You can crush them by hand or use the uh, cotton swab dipped in alcohol method. Uh, it is effective. You definitely have to make sure that you remove them though. Um, if you just, again, they're, they're hard waxy coating, it, it will protect them from, you know, if you just put a rubbing alcohol or horticultural oil on them, it won't work. Uh, the soaps and oils though are effective when they're in their earliest stage of life. It's called their crawler stage. So that's when they are moving around. They look totally different. They don't look like this, uh, but they're, they're pretty much minuscule, almost microscopic at that stage. And it's hard to catch them when they're in that life stage. Um, and you'll often have adults and the crawlers at the same time. So uh, it can be hard to, to catch them right at, at their crawler stage. So systemic insecticides uh, can be used, I, I think though, as a last resort. Um, they basically turn the whole plant into poison. So it's usually a granular insecticide. You put it on the soil and you water as normal. The plant takes up the insecticide and it turns the whole plant into, uh, you know, the, the plant then contains insecticide in its tissue. But the problem with that is that uh, if you have any kids or pets, um, it becomes a danger for them because if they eat any part of the plant, then they will have the insecticide and it's really, it's really nasty stuff. So definitely only as a last resort. And if you don't have anyone living with you that uh, you might worry about them coming into contact with it. Spider mites. I have seen uh, spider mites on, on houseplants a lot. I have had spider mites on my houseplants. Luckily, they are pretty easy to deal with. Uh, they are nearly microscopic, very tiny. In, the, in this photo here, they're like the little dots it almost look, they almost look like dust. And here's a close up. Uh, you can see these red, uh, red spider mites. They're really tiny, but they are sap sucking, soft bodied uh, arachnids. They're actually not an insect, they are an arachnid. Um, and symptoms of spider mites are leaf stippling or curling. So this is stippling. It's basically like just pinprick dots of discoloration on the leaves. That's from the uh, that's from the spider mites sucking the sap out of the leaf. It leaves these little pinprick marks. That's stippling and webbing, like here. I mean, they're an arachnid. They're a, they're a type of spider. Uh, they're, that's why they're called spider mites and they will make webs. So um, if, if it gets bad enough, you will see this webbing on, on the leaves, which can lead to curling. Uh, if it gets bad enough, um, that the, those growing tips will start to curl up. So again, spraying with a strong stream of water will knock them off, but insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils are very effective against these guys. If you, if you just get thorough coverage, it should take care of them. Um, but if, if it's really bad, if it's a prized plant and you just have to make sure that they're all gone, chemical miticides, uh, can be used as a last resort. Just make sure that it's a miticide, not an insecticide, because remember, these are in a, in a, uh, a mite, an arachnid, not an insect. And last but not least, everybody's favorite, fungus gnats. Um, these are also called soil gnats. They uh, live most of their life as a larva in the soil and they eat decaying plant material, the larva. They're tiny, tiny flies. They can almost be mistaken for mosquitoes, although they're much smaller. Uh, people also mistake them for fruit flies, uh, but again, they're actually even smaller than, than fruit flies and they, they look kind of different if you do look at them up close. So, um, but you know that you have uh, soil gnats if you see the adults flying around your plants. Uh, they're not very good flyers. They're kind of uh, weak on the wings. So they tend to just stay close to wherever uh, they came out of the soil. So you'll see them around pots, but they are attracted to light. And so I know often I'll be watching TV at night and I'll see one or two flying around my TV. Um, it's, it's almost just a part of having houseplants. These guys are, are tough to get rid of once you have them. 
But what you can do is use yellow sticky traps like this to monitor their population and to catch adults. So it will catch and kill adult, uh, adult soil gnats. Um, but allowing the soil to dry out as much as possible between watering is the most reliable method that I have found. I have tried them all, um, putting sand on top of the soil, putting cinnamon on top of the soil, using uh, the mosquito bits. It, it will work to kill the larva, but it's better as a preventative measure, okay? Once you have a, a huge infestation, using the soil drying method is gonna be your best bet. So, and unfortunately for some houseplants, that might not be tolerated very well. Things like peace lilies that really do not like to be dried out at all, uh, they might suffer. Um, but uh, the, if worse comes to worse, you can always repot things in new soil. Um, so hopefully that will, that will help you. If you're dealing with something that's like really, I'm so sure you have dealt with that before. They are, they are terrible. But on to diseases. So just a couple diseases we're going to talk about. Um, I think this is less, I think people deal with these less often than, um, than soil gnats, uh, especially, or um, in, you know, insect pests and diseases, especially if, if you're able um, to give plants the growing conditions that they like. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But once again, just to reiterate, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So to prevent infections and diseases, check new plants. If you're buying them from a nursery or if you're taking cuttings from a friend, check them for signs of, of pests and diseases and just don't, don't buy plants that don't look good. Um, and again, quarantine new plants away from your other plants so that you aren't spreading diseases uh, to your new plants. Two weeks is recommended. Uh, but getting back to what I was talking about, um, with not necessarily dealing with pests or diseases um, all that often is healthy plants don't get sick. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is if your plant is happy and growing and you're giving it the right light conditions and amount of water and it's thriving, it's less likely to get sick. Um, and if it does, it's gonna be a, more of like a fluke. Um, and less to do with, with your care than anything else. Um, so make sure that uh, whatever plants you're taking care of, that their needs are being met. And um, it, you know that a plant is, is happy and healthy if it's actively growing, putting out new growth and uh, flowering uh, if, if it is a plant that, that flowers. So root and stem rot, probably the most common, I would say definitely the most common diseases that uh, people will will encounter in their houseplant growing careers. Uh, different fungal species will cause root and stem rot. Phytophthora is the most common, but um, once it starts, it is hard to control. So it is caused by overwatering. So the main thing to remember is just to not overwater your plants. My method for watering is to feel the top inch of soil. This works for most plants. Just feel the top inch of soil. When the top inch is dry, that's when it's time to water. Um, because if, if, if you're overwatering, you end up with situations like this coleus has stem rot. You can see the, this part of the stem is starting to rot away. And this orchid has root rot. So these are the orchid roots. And you can see these ones are starting to get mushy, uh, not great. Um, this is not a death knell for either of these plants, uh, but if you catch it early, the, the earlier the better. Gray mold uh, is also called botrytis. Uh, so that the botrytis is the name of the fungus that causes gray mold, uh, but gray mold is the common name. Uh, this is a, a hibiscus flower that has gray mold growing on it. And this is a begonia leaf that has gray mold growing on it. Uh, it is a fungus that is an opportunistic fungus that will infect plants that are injured. Or you know, if you are pruning something, that point where you are pruning is an open wound and it will enter the plant through open wounds such as pruning wounds but it can affect flowers, leaves, as well as stems. So the best method to keep this from spreading to your plants is to make sure your tools are clean. Um, I use Lysol wipes to sanitize my tools. That's the fastest and the least corrosive to the tool. Um, you know, bleach will, will corrode metal. So uh, Lysol wipes are, are a good choice. Uh, but if you have to, 
copper or sulfur-based fungicides can be used if, if needed. And finally, viruses. These are not common, but I thought I would throw it in here because um, you know, we're in the middle of a viral pandemic uh, and, and just in case anybody didn't know, plants can get viruses too. Uh, these are not viruses that it can affect people, but they are kind of interesting to see on plants because again, they're not very common, but uh, they do crop up now and then. So they are often characterized by streaks on the leaves. So like this orchid has uh, streaks like this, that's sign of a virus uh, or concentric rings. These rings, this is an orchid leaf. Uh, these rings are from a virus, and this is a coleus leaf that has uh, these rings from uh, a virus infection. Unfortunately for plants, there is no cure to virus, uh, viral diseases. Uh, once they have them, they have them for life, and it's usually fatal. So um, most plants, once they have a virus, especially, you know, let's say you're an orchid grower or an orchid collector, if you have a plant in your collection that gets a virus, uh, you're probably going to have to be removed from the collection because there's not much to be done about it. Um, but again, cleaning your tools is, is very important, uh, as well as keeping insect pests in check um, and, and mites. So spider mites, aphids, they are insects that can actually pass viruses from one plant to another. So keeping those pests in check can help keep uh, the chances of, of your plants getting a virus down. Okay, and just very briefly, we are gonna talk about two kinds of house plants. Oops, let's see, what is it doing here? Loading, well, I'd rather not. Uh, let's see. Refresh. If you do slideshow and then do from, okay. Yeah, we'll get back <laughs> to where we were. <laughs> we're almost there. Uh, we almost made it. Okay, here we go. Okay. Is it gonna start me from there, please? No, okay. We will get to, there we go. Okay. All right. Anyway, <laughs> sorry for the malfunction. No, no problem. No problem. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're almost, at, we're almost at the end. I just wanted to touch on two kinds of houseplants that um, I think a lot of people are interested in. So uh, orchids being the first one, there are just a plethora of orchids. It's one of the largest plant families in the world. They're so diverse, so beautiful very common houseplants. Uh, Phalaenopsis are also called moth orchids. Those are the most common. So they have this kind of shape of flower, comes in all different colors, but the white white and purplish pink are, are the most common, uh, but there's all different kinds. These are cattleyas. Uh, this is a Vanda orchid. Uh, this is a Cymbidium. So the world of orchids is, is very diverse. And just like the world of orchids, orchid care uh, is also very diverse. So these are just some very general guidelines. Uh, different types of orchids have more specific care needs, but in general, orchids, if you're growing as a house plant, they prefer 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and some actually prefer temperature drops in the fall to trigger flowering in the winter. So like Phalaenopsis, for example, the moth orchids that everybody likes to buy uh, at the store, they, they actually like to have a drop in temperature uh, in the fall at night that will trigger, help to trigger their blooming. So uh, sort of interesting how different orchids have different needs, but just in general, that's sort of the guidelines. Humidity, most orchids prefer 40 to 70% humidity, uh, not exceptionally high, uh, but if you're having trouble with humidity levels, you can use a tray underneath the plant with gravel and water. So the water is not touching the, the pot that the plant is in, but it's just sitting in the tray with gravel. The gravel helps to dissipate the water. It increases the surface area. Water evaporates into the air around the plant. Um, and grouping plants together it can also help to increase the humidity just around it all, around the group of plants. So um, it, it, that's especially especially important in the winter time when there's lots of, of dry air. Potting medium. So again, different orchids have different requirements, but uh, using an orchid specific mix is a good idea. And most mixes are made of bark 
and moss, different combinations. So again, you can buy these in bulk and make your own uh, if you're really into it, but um, buying some pre-mixed ones is also good. Uh, some more care tips for orchids, watering. And again, this is just sort of general guidelines for orchids in general, but um, allowing the potting medium to become almost dry before watering is a good idea because orchids are more prone to being overwatered than underwatered. So it's a good idea to just go easy on the watering. Um, but when you do water, water thoroughly. So uh, water, uh, putting them in the sink is a good idea and just really thoroughly soaking the roots and allowing all the excess water to drain into the sink is a great idea. And of course the timing and amount of water that is required will depend on lots of factors, including, including the type of growing medium that you're using, the temperature, the amount of light, all that, all that good stuff. Speaking of light, most orchids like plenty of bright indirect light. Uh, so that means that they're not getting too much direct sun. So um, if the sun is shining directly through a south facing window all day, uh, they might not appreciate that. Uh, it can actually damage their leaves. But what you can do is move them just a little bit away from the window. So they're getting lots of bright light, but not so much of the direct sun. And uh, or east facing windows are great for orchids. They get the morning sun, a little bit of direct morning sun is no big deal. Uh, they'll like at that. So uh, they, they're pretty adaptable uh, once you get them used to your, or used to your growing conditions. And finally, herbs. So herbs are just, oh my gosh, fresh herbs. It's, it's a joy, right? Uh, but it doesn't have to be something that you only experience uh, during the summertime. So you can grow herbs indoors as, as houseplants. Uh, these are some of the more common ones uh, used and, and grown indoors. Uh, you can grow herbs indoors year round on a windowsill uh, using grow lights but it's, it's, just, it's just great to have fresh herbs. And uh, I definitely recommend experimenting and, and um, just trying it out because you might be surprised how well, how well they actually do. Uh, most prefer about 65 to 70 degrees indoors. Uh, but, so keep in mind that the temperature near a windowsill can drop at night. Um, it's not a huge deal for most herbs, but things like basil, basil is really sensitive to cold temperatures and anything below 70, they're really not going to be happy. So keep that in mind if, if you're growing something like basil. In terms of light, they need as much sun as possible. So put them in the sunniest window you have or use supplemental lights, right? We talked about LED lights, LED grow lights. Uh, this, is, this, this would be a situation where uh, they would benefit from having some supplemental light, especially in, in the winter time when there's not as much light. Watering, uh, basically uh, just sort of normal houseplant watering uh, for these guys, um, having a really well-drained Potting mix though is good and adding a little bit of extra vermiculite or sand um, or even just using a cacti mix. I have been known to just use cacti mix for, for plants that aren't cacti. Uh, so this would be a situation for that. Uh, they like extra drainage, most herbs do. Uh, so that can keep them happy and healthy and, and you'll have a, a supply of fresh herbs all year round. It's pretty cool. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. Uh, here's just some really quick uh, at the end additional resources to help you out, gardeninghelp.org. This is the Botanical Gardens uh, Gardening Help website. So uh, this would be where you'd find all kinds of information on, on growing houseplants, outdoor plants, anything related to gardening, as well as pests too, pests and diseases. Uh, the New Plant Parent uh, by Daryl Chang, a really great book. And then his website, houseplantjournal.com, Highly recommend checking it out. He has tons of articles and just amazing photos of his houseplants. So really great. And if, if you saw those photos of uh, the Venus flytraps and the pitcher plants and your interest was piqued, um, The Savage Garden is a great book about uh, carnivorous plants. So uh, highly recommend it if you have any interest in carnivorous plants. Uh, and so feel free to, to ask questions. I can answer some. Uh, for a little bit here. And again, though, um, 
Uh, you can contact the garden if you have any gardening questions related to house plants or otherwise. Uh, plant information at mobot.org is our email, but you can also call the Horticulture Answer Service Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Our phone number is there. It's a free service. Anybody can call. You don't have to be a member or anything like that. It's We're just here to help you and your plants. So, um, But I am here to, uh, now to answer any questions that you might have. Um, uh Justine, Susan has a question about um, small insects. Sometimes I leave a glass of juice or wine. I will find small bugs that will land and die in the glass. Are those fruit flies or one of the other bugs you talked about? Which bugs are attracted to the sweetness and the sugar? Yeah, soil gnats are attracted to uh, things like, like wine, like glasses of wine or juice. Um, one of the methods actually of of dealing with soil gnats is to have a bowl of apple cider vinegar out. Uh, they'll be attracted to that. So it might be, it might be soil gnats uh, or, or the fungus gnats. It might be. Um, again, they can be mistaken for fruit flies. I, I think what distinguishes them is fruit flies are usually a brownish color um, and they have red eyes. Most of them have red eyes. Soil gnats are, are smaller than fruit flies. They're black and they have black eyes. They're just like a, a tiny, they almost, they do kind of look mosquito-like, but they're just very, very tiny. So that's what I would use to distinguish them. Um, and, you know, hey, they're already dead after they flew into your, into your glass probably. So maybe fish them out and, and, and get a magnifying glass and get in there and, and see if you can figure it out. So, but yeah, again, fruit flies are kind of brownish in color with red eyes and uh, soil gnats, fungus gnats, they are, are black. Christine, can you um, stop your uh, screen share so that we can see yeah. everybody on the screen? That would be great. Yes. Thank you. And Francine, do you have a question? Yes, I wanna know how often you recommend repotting houseplants. Mm -hmm. Good question. So for most houseplants, if you see roots coming out of the bottom, of, of the drainage hole, they'll, they'll actually start to grow through the drainage hole. That is a telltale sign, okay, <laughs> it is time to repot. But otherwise, I would say every two years maybe, and that's more just to refresh the soil. Uh, the the, the um, most potting mixes, commercial potting mixes, they don't last forever. You know, it's it, it, the soil's not gonna last forever in, in that pot. It's gonna start to break down and um, what I found is that eventually uh, the, it won't hold as much water anymore and, um, and the plant will start to suffer. So that's another sign that, okay, it's time to repot. Uh, uh, maybe, and yeah, maybe bump it up a size or just put it back in the same pot with some fresh soil. Uh, but yeah, I would say roots coming out the bottom or if you're finding you have to water more often, if the water is just, you put the water in and it just comes right at the bottom, uh, that's, a, that's a telltale sign that it needs new soil. Um, and then Victoria, is it possible, Victoria asks the question, is it possible to grow herbs if you don't have any place where they have access to the sun? Yeah, so that would be a perfect situation for using a grow light. Uh, again, there's LED grow lights, but there's also fluorescent uh, grow lights. And there's kits you can buy that include everything you need, a little stand for the light, a little pots to put your plants in. Those are really great. Uh, so, uh, and I would just follow whatever instructions come with the light because again, different lights have different intensities. So it should give you instructions on how long to leave it on for different types of plants. Um, and how far away the light should be from the plants. If the light is too close, the leaves will actually get burned, almost like they're getting sunburn. Uh, so things definitely, yeah, good things to keep in mind uh, if you're gonna go the, the route of supplemental lighting, but herbs, they do really well with it. So I, I would encourage you to try it out. And she also asked, what kits do you recommend? Um, I know, I think there's one called Aero Garden uh, that I've used, that it's a hydroponic setup. So it's actually doesn't have any soil. Uh, it just uses water and a mineral mix that is circulated around the plant. So you can use that to grow herbs and also lettuce and, and little uh, thing and things like that. Uh, I think that one was called Arrow Garden. I could be I could be remembering wrong, but um, yeah. Where would be I, the I, best? I know that's one that I've used, but yeah. Well, I was going to say where would there. where would be the best place to look for a kit? 
Sure. I would say either, you know, Amazon, the internet, or go to your local garden center and see what they might have, uh, maybe in their more like gift, gift oriented section, possibly, uh, or just like the gardening, you know, the more gardening focused areas, uh, you might find some grow kits uh, that include a grow light. Um, I have a personal question. I grow, I grow a lot of orchids and mm -hmm. I have them grouped together and they love mm -hmm. the window that I have them in and some of them are Great. very old. Mm -hmm. But um, the question I have is, you know, there's a couple of them that the leaves get very limp and then they quit flowering. They mm -hmm. sometimes come back, but the leaves, I can't, you know, I water them all the same mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of them are, are happy. And then all of a sudden one of them might just have limp leaves. <laughs> yeah, limp leaves on orchids is usually a sign of some type of watering issue. Hmm. Okay. okay, so again, it can be a little hard to tell whether it's underwatering or overwatering because the symptoms kind of look similar. Um, are the leaves wrinkly as well as droopy? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that might be, I would, I would hazard to guess that that is underwatering. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so they might be saying, hey, I need a little bit of extra water here. Um, I need a little bit more than maybe my neighbor. So uh, yeah, that would be my guess. Uh, the wrinkliness is, is sometimes a, a clue that it's underwatering versus overwatering. But again, it can be hard to tell. So um, <laughs> if they start to look droopy and the growing medium that they're in is, is still moist, then leave, you know, let them sit there for a little bit, don't water them anymore, and hopefully they'll perk back up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Rick said, I have a fig leaf plant mm -hmm. where the roots are in a circular pattern. I moved it from a smaller pot to a larger one. Is it necessary to loosen the root pattern? I think I would, especially for something like, like a fig, uh, uh, any kind of ficus. Um, you know, they're going to be growing like a tree. And so similar to a tree, if the roots start to grow in a circle around the, the trunk, it can girdle itself and you can end up with, with a problem. So um, I, I've, I don't think it's as common in houseplants as outdoor trees, but I, I, would, I, would, I think I would sort of, especially if you take it out of the container and you can see that they're they're sort of going in a circular motion, just loosen them up a little bit and uh, they'll, they'll, I think they'll appreciate that. Do we have some more questions? I'm not, let's see, here's another question about the um, kits and mm -hmm. can a new bag of potting soil be treated for soil mites before putting the plants in? Yes. So one thing you can do is dry out your potting mix, just totally dry it out, let it be totally desiccated. Uh, I, I would just do this outside if it was me in the sun, uh, but you can also do it in the oven if you want your house to smell like uh, pot, cooking potting soil. Um, so I, I would only do this if, if you're buying a soil mix that you know doesn't have any kind of beneficial microbes in it. It's sort of becoming more popular now to have uh, beneficial fungi mixed into potting mix. Um, so obviously if you put that in the oven uh, just to dehydrate it, it wouldn't be good for, for the fungi, but um, that is one way you can get rid of soil nests. Make sure that it just doesn't have anything living in there is to basically cook it out um, or just let it be totally dry. I've had the most luck um, with potting mixes that are just totally dry when I buy them. Most are not like that. Most are, are sort of moist. Um, but having totally dry potting mix seems to work much better. And the Marilyn would like um, to know, is it ever appropriate to go from a larger pot to a smaller pot if a plant starts to fail and some parts die, but is it, st but it's the plant still hanging on. Um, so would it be uh, recommended to go from a larger pot to a smaller pot? Sure. Yeah. I actually just had this happen to me with a ZZ plant. I had a ZZ plant that was, uh, it was very large. Uh, I, I put it in, in, a, in a pot that was correctly sized for the plant that I had, but uh, I lost half of it this winter uh, to root rot. And so um, when I realized what was happening, I, I uh, took 
took out the rotting part, separated it out, and made sure that there wasn't anything happening to the other half. And yeah, I put it into a smaller, I ended up having to put it into a smaller pot. So that is definitely something that can happen. Um, you know, it, it's getting the correct size pot the first time, uh, it doesn't always happen. So uh, through, you know, through circumstances outside of your control or, or otherwise, but it's no big deal to, to put, put a plant into a smaller pot. And just like putting, just like any kind of transplanting, it might be in a little state of shock for, for, for a couple of days, maybe a week, but it should bounce back and, and do just fine. Well, we're getting close to time. Do we have any other questions? We have time for maybe one more. I'm not seeing any. Um, okay. Justine, that was a wonderful right. program. Oh, we thank you really so much. appreciate you being here. Um, Stephen, did you have anything you would like to say? You have to unmute. You have to unmute. <laughs> I want to just say thank you to you on behalf of all of us, Justine. You, it just flows. You have so much knowledge. You shared it so generously. It was so understandable and so helpful. So thank you for making the time for to be with us. And thank you for all the lovely things you're doing at the Botanic Gardens for all of us. Great. Thank you so much. I hope to see you all at the garden someday. I, I yes, really do. <laughs> yes. um, also, I wanted to mention to you, if you would um, send me those con that contact information and those recommendations in an email that you oh, yeah, have sure. on your screen, I can share that with everyone okay. here today. Absolutely. I'll do okay. that. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye, you everyone. Bye. Have a good day.